Um, so those of you, sorry, that just come, I'm Mary from the Anglica Social Action and Research Centre. And um, yeah, you you all know that we're talking about digital inclusion and the research that Anglica has just done. Um, so just about why we did this research. Um, and there's some things particularly to Tasmania that are important um, when we're talking about digital technology and inclusion. Um, at least one third of Tasmanians are low income and struggling with the costs of daily living. So mobile phones and the internet can just be additional financial burdens for this group of people. Um, um, Tasmania also has the highest rates of disability and um, people aged over 65, so we need strategies particular to these two groups of people to ensure that they can remain connected. Yeah, nice chairs. Um, and then also, um, we also have about half of Tasmanians are um, illiterate or innumerate, and so this is um, a large proportion of the community that have trouble reading and writing, so when we add a, another layer of digital technology and digital um, literacy, that just further complicates matters. Um, what we tried to do with this research is find out how low-income Tasmanians are currently using digital technology, what technologies they're using and how they're using them. By seeking this information, we were hoping that Ang Anglicare could provide information to other service providers in government about a baseline about the digital, current digital technology use in Tasmania. And then we could further develop strategies so that we could better address um, digital inclusion and strategies that would particularly help low-income Tasmanians. Um, because with the right approach, digital technology can be a, a really powerful tool for social inclusion and to bring people up and together. Um, I'll ne now briefly explain how we did this research. Um, so we interviewed 750 Tasmanians. Um, we did this by telephone survey and it took about 15 minutes. Um, everyone that was interviewed had to um, be concession card holder and currently be using a mobile phone. Um, like all SARC research, we had a reference group, and so for this reference group, um, for, sorry, for this research, we had um, Anglicare's own IT manager, Rob Hitting, um, Brendan Fitzgerald from Info Exchange, David Bartlett from Explore, and Anthony Deck from the Social Inclusion Unit. Um, our survey asked people how they use digital technology. We asked them what kind of internet access they had, how they paid for their bills, um, and what kind of digital equipment they used for what for different reasons. We did not seek to interview people who currently didn't use de digital technology, but we hoped that our research would then provide information that would also um, answer those questions. So what did we find out? Um, at established delivery level, we found that the people who are on low, income, low incomes and do have access to digital te technology use a combination of different digital techniques, as well as the older styles of communication of landlines and doing things in person. For example, while almost two-thirds of people use their computer to search for government information, when it came to actually contacting government services, they prefer to do this in person or on a landline telephone. Older Tasmanians in particular are more likely to go in person to access a government service. Only about a third of people who had used, an internet, sorry, had used the computer to access a community organisation, again, most people prefer to go to a community organisation in person or make a phone call. We found that the internet was a key um, resource for health information, so this is important for government and community sector to know. We also found that one quarter, only one quarter of people surveyed had used free Wi-Fi. This may be due to limited access, but also limited to understanding of how Wi-Fi works. Digital technology is also important and being used um, today for the way people find work. About three quarters of the job seekers interviewed um, used their personal computer to assist with job hunting. So this raises the question about all the people that, with low digital literacy or not access to a computer, how they're able to, seek, able to find jobs. On a personal and social level, about a third of the people surveyed contacted their family and friends via mobile or smartphone. But the, but the main preference was to use a landline telephone. When, compared, when we compared our data to the general population, we found that Tasmanians on a low income are less likely to be engaged in social media. We found a link between social media use and education level. So half of those surveyed that had a post-school qualification had used social media, while less than a third who had not finished year 10 were not using social media. 
Um, as services are increasingly using social media platforms to contact clients, it's really important to remember that not everyone's actually engaging in this um, communication technique. I'll now focus on two particular interests to Anglicare, so people with disabilities and older Tasmanians. Compared to the rest of Australia, Tasmania has the highest rate of people with disability. And compared to the broader community, people with disability have higher rates of unemployment, lower educational qualifications and lower household incomes. Many with people with disabilities are isolated and lonely and at high risks of social exclusion. However, the effective use of digital technology can be really powerful to promote their inclusion in the community. Um, the accessibility of telecommunications for people with disabilities has been a long-standing problem. There's considerable, already considerable research and policy literature on this area, um, and some of the barriers they, people with disabilities encounter um, include the, the, um, sorry, the, the access with um, smaller handsets and not being able to read um, screens, um, different ring tones, so there's a whole lot of barriers there for people with disabilities. Um, our survey included 165 Tasmanians with a disability and like low other, other low income Tasmanians, they do use digital technology to seek information online, access services, pay bills and communicate with family and friends. <coughs> we found that um, people with disabilities were more likely so, we're more likely to find out about government services online, 66% compared to 59%. We're more likely to use their personal computer, 60% compared to... I'm um, sorry, more likely to use their personal computer for entertainment, 60% uh, compared to 56%. Um, we're more likely to make use of free Wi-Fi offered in the community, to use their mobile phone or smartphone to communicate with community services, and to, act, and to communicate with mo um, their family and friends on their mobile and smartphone, 40% compared to 31%. Um, Tasmania also has the highest um, proportion of people aged over 65 in Australia, and also the number of Tasmanians, the number of older Tasmanians is growing and expected to grow at a faster rate than the rest of the population. Many older people in Tasmania are experiencing financial hardship. Two thirds of Tasmanians aged 65 to 74 live in households reliant on pensions, government pensions and allowances as their main source of income. And the latest census shows that almost two thirds of older Tasmanians receive incomes lower than the poverty line. Digital technology has the potential to provide social benefits for older Tasmanians, particularly those who live alone, by allowing them to connect to family and friends and by providing easier access to services. However, older Tasmanians face a number of barriers to become confident with new, de new digital technologies. For example, many older Tasmanians lack the technological knowledge, which can lead to discomfort, anxiety and low confidence. They have audio and visual problems in hearing mobile phones and seeing small text. Many, many older Tasmanians have limitations in fine motor skills. And older people have difficulties finding smaller handsets quickly when they are ringing. <coughs> in addition to this, older people have a strong attachment to their fixed landline number and tend to um, retain this technology and are reluctant to go mobile only as they fear losing a way to keep in contact with old friends and businesses. Of the 750 low-income Tasmanians that participated in our survey, nearly half was age 65 years and old, over. This is obviously a higher representation than the general population, which has influenced our results. Compared to the younger respondents our survey, in our survey, we found that older Tasmanians are less likely to own a smartphone, 24% compared to 41%, use a mobile phone or smartphone to perform internet-related tasks, use email, 69% compared to 80%, access free Wi-Fi, 18% compared to 32%, or participate in social media. 30% compared to 57%. Our survey indicated that many older people are accessing the internet on their home computer and are browsing and searching for information. However, when it actually make, goes to the step of making contact with organisations, they will do this in person or by a landline telephone. We found that they are more likely than younger age groups to communicate with family and friends using a telephone call, particularly a landline, make contact with Centrelink on a landline, make contact with Tasmanian government services and community organisations in person, and bank and make bill payments in person. This is important information for us to understand. Many government departments, particularly Centrelink, are going um, 
promoting online services only and reducing frontline staff. And this is causing problems for older people who would rather see someone in person than communicate via the internet. While there are a number of programs aimed at addressing barriers for older people, um, it's important for us to keep an eye on how we're delivering our services to this particular age group and to make sure that we're not leaving anybody behind. So what next? Um, firstly, to recap on the barriers identified for low-income Tasmanians, or particular to Tasmania, um, we have a high proportion of people on a low income with a disability or age 65 or over. It's difficult for people on low incomes to afford the cost of internet and mobile phone services. And many Tasmanians struggle with numeracy and literacy. So when we look at how to help Tasmanians to be connected, we need to keep these, in mind these limitations. To help all Tasmanians be connected to services and community, we need our government to ensure that websites meet the National Web Accessibility Guidelines to a level AA. <coughs> we need our governments to move all their, one their phone numbers to 1800 numbers so that calls from mobile phones are free. Um, this, is good. this is mandated from 1st of January next year. Um, we're encouraging the Tasmanian government to develop a digital inclusion strategy that includes the promotion of digital inclusion initiatives through government, community and business partnerships, which is something that Tegan will talk about. Um, and we believe Australia should build on the work the state governments have already done with the online access centres to further promote digital li literacy, provide training and technical support and offering free Wi-Fi. We encourage all, government, um, all levels of government to offer a range of contact options, including landlines, reception staff, um, for people that use these services. And we encourage the Australian government to include digital training as part of its commitment to the Digital First Strategy and national rollout of the NBN. Initiatives such as broadband for seniors, internet safety for seniors and the My Aged Care website should all be expanded. And the National Disability Insurance Agency's price list currently does include um, some um, assistive technology on it, but we missing in there is um, any funding to provide training for people with disability, their carers and family on how to use that assistive technology and then the ongoing costs of maintaining it. So we encourage this to be included in the price list. Um, there's also an important role for the telecommunications industry. In Australia, Telstra is responsible for um, meeting the universal, universal service obligation to ensure that everyone has re um, reasonable access on an equitable basis to landlines and payphones. However, the telecommunications industry has changed a lot since the USO was first established, and we believe it now should be reviewed to take into account mobile and digital technology. We suggest that Telstra could expand its mobile, phone, mobile programs that are currently offered under the Access for Everyone program, could promote the hardship team so that more community organisations and people working with low income low-income people know about it, promote the Telstra Easy Call and Telstra Easy T Touch discovery phones for people with disabilities and older people, and um, like all, um, all telecommunications companies, implement the free 1800 numbers at no charges um, next year. Um, as far as all communication providers, we're encouraging them to all develop low-income internet and low-income mobile phone plan options. Um, there's also a role for Anglicare and other community organisations um, to work harder in, to make sure that we can communicate with clients in a range of ways. We can't rely on a one-size-fits-all approach. As this survey shows, some people we serve can communicate with us in different ways. Some ways community organisations can improve their digital um, connection with all Tasmanians are that we can support clients by teaching them how to use digital technologies. And there's also a role <coughs> for supporting... The, um, our staff and how they can use digital technologies so they can then in turn help clients. We can provide training for people who would benefit from the use of assistive technology. We can make sure our, our websites meet the Australian Government Web Content Accessibility Guidelines also to a level at AA. We can make sure we offer 1800 numbers so that they're out, we can be contacted free from our mobile. And we can tell our clients about the availability of free phone apps that can help them with their uh, managing their credit and paying their bills. While there's still a lot to do, there are a number of great initiatives already happening in community organisations and governments to assist with um, particular groups and low-income people being connected. 
Tegan's going to talk a bit more about what um, InfoExchange is doing nationally. But I'm just going to talk about a couple of programs that Anglicare is currently doing. So we currently are in our families area, we provide training to parents on parent, we, sorry, we run parenting courses. And to complement that, we've started up a family relationships, um, this is the one, a family relationships Facebook page. Um, currently the page has a number of regular users and through its connections with other organisations reaches over 40, over 4,000 parents. The page shares articles, best practice, books and stories about parenting and responds to que questions parents have. It has high credibility and positive feedback from parents of other service providers. Almost every parent involved um, in doing one of the parenting courses through Anglicare does use Facebook, so has then gone on to join the forum. The staff have also found that it's a useful way for them to share information as the whole team has access to the page so they can see how each other are communicating with parents. Similarly, our Northwest Early Start Therapeutic Support Team, otherwise known as NESTS, has the NESTS Anglicare Tasmania page. This page currently has 245 users and NESTS workers post articles, pictures, quotes and um, that reinforce the discussions they are already having with their parents. Um, users also then like other pages and um, the NEST team like pages to connect parents in with other community organisations happening in their local area. Um, the family relations team, um, like, sorry, like the family relations team, NEST is also found that every parent involved in their program is also on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Thanks for listening today and I'm really pleased to officially actually launch the research. So <laughs> we've all got a snapshot of the research there and then the full report is available on our Angli Anglicare website today. today. So that's available there and the snapshot's there. Um, I'm Tegan from Info Exchange. Um, I'm a community engagement officer with Info Exchange, and currently um, we're working on a national digital literacy program in conjunction and partnership with Australia Post. And it's about um, connecting 300,000 Australians online who aren't already connected, or getting them to increase their digital confidence so that they can utilise some of the benefits that Mary was just talking about. Um, so the focus of the talk today is a little bit of a snapshot of DI in Australia overall. Um, we'll be talking about, then I'll be talking about in more detail about the GoDigi project and then um, how any of you, if you want to, as community service organisations, could get involved. Um, so this is kind of the digital inclusion framework that we work off. It's a honeycomb kind of thing. So on the basis you have the, I don't know if this works, but it's not working on the LED screen, that's pretty funny. Um, so we've got affordable hardware, affordable access, digital <coughs> literacy, consumer protection and accessibility. So, um, you know, some programs in the past, they might have provided one of these things, but they haven't provided all of the things, so therefore the, it, hasn't, it hasn't worked. So we really need a whole, whole of approach, not just talking about one of these things is going to solve digital inclusion. Um, we need to be addressing all of these things um, together. So we create autonomy of access, social support, bandwidth equality, digital engagement, which then in turn creates the ideal outcomes that we all want, which are social engagement, education achievement, economic development, civic engagement, and of course, increased quality of life. Um, so CSIRO released a report recently about digital inclusion Australian, it was around the broadband gap. So at the moment, there's about 4 million Australians who aren't online. And um, so that equates to about 20% of the population, 23% of the population. Um, so, and the reason that this is happening is, you know, there's um, a confidence barrier, there's resourcing challenges, um, affordability, <coughs> the lack of necessary skills and a low awareness about the benefits of being connected can bring. Um, so how can we build bridges? Well, there's a number of ways. Um, you know, we can provide, there's, you know, government things that we can do, which we can't do as community service organisations just provide greater certainty around broadband infrastructure. Um, but what we can do is encourage collaboration, address barriers to adoption, and we can be digital champions in our society. Um, so, you know, th we can do this by communicating to our communities about um, the relevance to the internet and being connected and being digitally confident can bring to them individually and as, um, as a society in whole. Um, we can 
raise digital literacy through education and training um, and we can also review our business processes and how they can become more digitally inclusive into the future. Um, also, there's obviously economic benefits. It's not just the benefits <coughs> we talked about um, to individuals. There's also benefits to our society as a whole. So, for example, um, this report released um, said, you know, one one face-to-face -face transaction is worth a hundred online transactions. So stuff like that. So if you can if you can um, help more people to be digitally confident, and digitally literate, then you can actually um, raise your productivity levels and help more people with. Um, so you can spend less time. Um, you, can, you, you can do more with the same amount of money that you couldn't do before. And, and obviously there's household savings, so you can see here $700 a year for communication, $1,000 a year for information and media. Um, so for example, Robert men mentioned before in his keynote speech that um, you know, there's online only, there's online only services like saving you know, $300 a year on your insurance that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do if you weren't online. So those types of savings for the people that are affected um, could actually become really crucial and important. Um, so to address this problem, InfoExchange has partnered with Australia Post as a national community partner. Um, we've got a program called Go Digi. So, um, it addresses, we're trying to tackle digital literacy because we feel like there's a lot of work being done in affordability, accessibility um, and the network across Australia but what's really missing is, um, is the digital literacy and the digital confidence and the knowledge in the community about the benefit that digital literacy and being connected can bring to individuals and society. So, um, We've got the digital platform is central to GoDigi, and so that's being released in December, December 15th. Finally, it'll be um, ready, ready for the world to use. Um, so on the digital platform, um, there's, there's kind of four things that are facilitated on there. We've got learning content. We found that that's one of actually the barriers during our research um, developing this platform, that one of the barriers to um, people learning and connecting is actually that there's not a lot of information out there that starts really at that zero base level. So what's an app, for example, is something that we would probably all know and just take for granted as a piece of information. But the 20% of Australia and probably more who aren't that digitally confident don't know what that is. So things like that are addressed in the learning content. Things like um, how to set up an email address, what's a browser, what's the internet, what's the World Wide Web through to how do I sell stuff online? How do I, um, you know, how do I search for gardening tips? So a lot of different um, things are covered, ranging from task oriented through to interests. But um, what this does is this information is all available on the digital platform. But the way that we disperse this information, we're obviously only one organisation. So the plan is to work with people in the community who are already running digital literacy training or who want to run digital literacy training and providing them these creative common materials that they can use and adapt for their own <coughs> communities, free to use, for you to then run events um, that are relevant to your community and to your um, situation. As we know, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach, which is why we have such a range of content. So that kind of brings me on to the next part of the um, GoDigi platform, which is the partner network. So what we want partner partners to do um, is to register, use our content, um, put, their, put their, their events online. Because another thing that's a really big challenge for digital literacy in Australia is that there are a lot of people running events and there are a lot of great programs, but no one's look as it is so often common in the community sector, um, it's really hard to talk and notice what's going on around you when, you're so, when you have so limited funds, you're just focused on the service delivery. So this is a way to, for an umbrella for digital literacy in Australia where we want, we encourage um, partner network organisations to come on, use our content, put their events online so that then um, everybody can kind of access that, access that material online. So we have, um, you know, other organisations, social workers, maybe Centrelink, um, a referral, there's some, they're trying to get someone into online services but they can't get them so they look up the local library, okay, here, here's the place to start with your digital confidence journey, um, which follows into to the partner, um, to the mentor program. So the mentor program will be released <laughs> later next year in June and that's about getting um, individuals from the community saying, hey, yeah, uh, I put my hand up, I definitely want to mentor someone. I'll mentor someone, I'll mentor my aunt or I'll mentor my neighbour next door. 
Um, but the other way that you can get involved as a mentor is to actually register with one of our partner network organisations as a mentor volunteer, as a digital skills mentor, and go, yes, I'm ready to, you know, donate. Maybe it's only three one-hour sessions across the year, but I want to I wanna donate my time. Please let me volunteer. Match me up with someone in the community. Um, and I want to mentor them in their digital skills journey. And then, so I briefly touched on just before the learning events, so pop-up events. So we want partner networks um, to be putting their events onto the digital platform, but we'll also be running events around Australia and working with Australia Post. Um, across the country, obviously, Australia Post is a wide-ranging network. It has the biggest network of infrastructure and transport lines in Australia. So working with them to run events around the country um, for people to access learning. And then that will all be complemented in 2016. We'll have the year, National Year of Digital Inclusion, which will include a conversations tour. So it'll be, again, around the country. Um, and that'll be more for the network partners and um, the general population, because the other challenges that we have, um, there's the don't know, don't know curve of the individuals not online. So they don't know that they need to be online and they don't know the benefits. So therefore, they don't know that they need to tell, they need, they need to put their hand up and go, hey, we need help getting online. But it goes the other way in that um, the general population also don't know that there's so many people who aren't online and how disadvantaged they are because of this fact. So um, raising some general public awareness around, around the fact that digital ex exclusion is, does exist and it ha has such a big impact on the people who are excluded and what they can do to help. Um, yeah, so I just went through all of that, uh, all of the six elements of the GoDigi project. Um, I'll just skip through that one. Um, so this is a little um, a hint of what's to come. So this is the GoDigi platform and it'll be ready on December 15th. Um, so there's three distinct there's three distinct areas, there's a learner, a mentor, or a partner. So um, watch out for that, December 15th, it's coming, hopefully. Um, <laughs> no, it's definitely coming, it's definitely coming. I know it's a little bit close to Christmas, but we're really excited about it. And we welcome anyone who wants to um, join in and become a partner to do so. Um, so I guess the ways that this can align with the work that Anglicare and Mary have just released is obviously, Tasmania, um, the Tasmanian government, it'd be great to get a digital inclusion a strategy um, and develop some digital inclusion in initiatives through government and community and private partnerships. And how we see this working is that we've put a lot of time and um, resources into creating um, these learning materials that uh, address the fact that we only have, like, I think, across Australia, 55% func like adult literacy and numeracy. So I address that fact by the um, all of the guides are written for about a year seven level. They're 500 words or less each, generally speaking. Um, we've put a lot of resources into thinking <laughs> about um, these training materials so that then other people who uh, come along onto the digital inclusion journey can just feel free to use our materials and they don't have to spend that amount of time and effort and money on creating those resources and they can actually focus on um, impacting more people in their community. Um, and also it'd be great to, you know, build on the work of the online access centres in the state um, to promote digital literacy as well, because that's half the battle is um, that engagement and kind of awareness raising. Um, and it'd be great to see digital training as, as part of the commitment to um, the Digital First strategy and rollout of the NBN. Unfortunately, it hasn't been that great so far. <laughs> um, there has been amount of dollars committed, but in the conditions of um, <laughs> providing that money, there hasn't been anything about accessibility or um, you know literacy or numeracy levels. So it's a bit disappointing. But hopefully, in the future, it, um, increases in efficiency and um, obviously continue. We recommend continuing um, and expanding initiatives for older Australians, as they do have sometimes more challenges than the rest of the. Um, people we're trying to impact um, to kind of get online, such as such as broadband for seniors. And so, um, another thing that Mary mentioned, which is probably an, a, a challenge that we see too, is um, there's a lot of awesome organisations doing great things, and that they want to support their clients in getting digital, but they might actually be having some digital confidence issues themselves. So, we also see as this GoDigi as a great opportunity to actually 
um, as an education piece for staff, for staff bodies and for staff members to increase their digital confidence before then helping someone else. And, um, and then, as Mary said before, you know, providing training for people who will benefit from the use of assistive technology. To use assistive technology, you first have to have that digital confidence as that kind of that really key piece. And if you don't have that, then it's, it's, it can be quite challenging to use some of this assistive technology. And obviously, spread the word. Um, you know, if your clients have some digital confidence um, that, or some kind of digital literacy where they're able to go online, tell them about GoDigi resources. Um, anyone can register as a learner and track their progress through the program as well. So um, they can favourite the guides that they want. So maybe. Um, how to check their inbox is something that they regularly forget and that's what we found in our research too that um, people want to print out instructions and reread them over and over again so that they can um, continue to um, have independence online. So yes, please um, join GoDigi as a network partner when we launch. Um, you can get in contact with either myself or um, the Digital Inclusion Manager at Info Exchange, B Brendan, who's unable to be here today. Um, and yeah, it, it'd be great to see you all online and in person somewhere in the near future. Thank you. <laughs>
they don't want to do it, it's because they're scared, but they don't want to admit that they're scared or, um, un, you know, unwilling to do it. It's probably um, in terms of people who probably don't want to be connected, that still is only maybe, is it 10%, Robert? 10%. People who, people who are actually making the choice. But the thing is, um, you know, people talk about this. They're like, oh, so what about if people don't want to be connected? It's like, well, you have to give them that choice first to let them decide. Just because they're disconnected now doesn't mean they don't want to be connected. They don't know about the benefits of being connected. So how can you say they're making that decision for themselves? Yeah. Um, in the full research report, um, we, one of the case studies we looked at was um, the partnership with Brotherhood of St Lawrence. Their iPads for seniors, which is... And there's some wonderful quotes in there um, for people who, so that was the people that, older, older people that wouldn't even use technology and the, the thought was too great. And then once they actually started to use an iPad and they could communicate with their grandchildren and they could share photos and I think, um, um, but there were, you know, yeah, the apps where they could find their music from the 1940s and the 1950s and it just, so just simple tasks but it just opened up their world. And they actually formed groups where they'd get together with their iPad over a coffee and share the information. So it was, it was, yeah, it was a really lovely um, case study that's worked. Yeah. I think the other thing is changing your attitude about digital technology. It's so, it's so part of a lot of what we do. It's, it's not necessarily there's a computer class over here and the rest of life is over here. It's about integrating digital technologies if you're running those kind of learning and training sessions into what you're doing. So. Um, you know, for, say for example in a community garden it wouldn't be iPads and then the community garden would be a oh, community garden, oh hey I, I brought along an iPad today, let's look up when this, this flower is not coming up, let's look what's happening with it, let's research it on the internet. So in, incorporating it into, into the, I guess, the, the way of thinking and, using, and thinking about it as a tool <laughs> rather than something separate is a, a way to change people's behaviour around it too. Just got a question, Mary. In regards to the research, did you also look at metro versus regional areas as well? Um, we did. Um, off the top of my head, I can't. That's in the full research report, yeah. but we did. We yeah, we in, we tried to get a cross section of the seven hundred and fifty people interviewed um, of household structures, genders, um, backgrounds, and the three regions were represented. Um, yeah, as I said, the the only skew was we had a lot more older people in the survey. Um, but that's indicative of phone surveys. <laughs> so. Can the GoDigi training material be used to train staff who work with disability or with aged care clients in particular, or, or, or low income people? Can it be yeah. used in a different way to how it's set up with yeah. mentoring and things like that? Yeah, no, um, that we'd love it. We just want more people to be digitally confident and digitally literate. We don't mind how it's used. That's up to the community and the people who. Um, want to learn, that's fine, yeah. So, um, I mean, our target audiences are people on low incomes, people living with a disability, people from Indigenous backgrounds, um, people with English as a second language. Um, anyone else? No, that's it. That's <laughs> so, um, oh, and older Australians. Um, yeah, no, so we're happy for the information to be used however you want to use it, yeah. So, do you have any sort of um, understanding of how many Tasmanians on low income have no access to a landline, so use a mobile only. I don't, sorry. Yeah. I wonder if Robert might, would, would you have that sort of information? Look, I, I'm not sure. In the older age group, is that what you, you mean? Oh, uh, generally across the population. Oh, across the population. I think it's around about 20 to 25%. Um, the word mobile only sort of households, yeah. yeah. And uh, are they but in, the, in an old age group, it's, it's a lot less, I guess. It's right, yeah, sure. yeah. So, mm -hmm. the results that you've got here would, would not include those, those people, include the people who have no mobile yeah. yes, yeah. They, they, they do or don't, if, yes, they do. Okay, so, they had, yep, yeah, the two requirements were they a concession card holder and they had to use the mobile phone, sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, but that could and then they had landlines as well, yeah. yeah. Sure. Have you had any problems or issues with inappropriate comments or people are being very nice? Um, I, I don't think so. I, don't I think, think there so. might have been one comment that's yep. been taken down over the whole time. If that. Yeah, and you took it down straight away. So that's um, that's the oh, sorry. Yeah, we manage that through our programs. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, they have to look at 
Do you just take it down or do you try and respond or it just depends on the comment? Yeah, I don't know. I gave my phone call. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just wondering because we're thinking about you know getting a Facebook page and, and you know that there's a possibility that could happen. So I'm just wondering how it's going. We're trialling yeah. it at the moment, so yeah. we're using it as a bit of a test case to work out some policies and procedures. So just quickly, as it comes up, the, 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 the line on that is that you, you don't engage in the in the slinging match. No. You make it make sure it's one-sided. No. Yeah. But and I think there's... Unless, unless, it's unless there's a legitimate core of yeah. information that you need to... But just seeing sometimes, like, on the airline Facebook pages and stuff, I, you know, I do um, sort of think that there is some time where the airline can keep it there and also put their reply on. Any other questions or yeah, comments? I'm just have one for Tegan. Tegan, with the, the website with its launch and it's got the information for people to learn, is there yeah. also information for people who want to perhaps be mentors and the best yeah, way to yeah. the training? And yeah, training? yeah. So we've got um, we've got packs for both mentors and for network partners. So for people who want to get on, we've got some information and some kind of training guidelines for. Um, those people who are interested. Um, one suggestion was that you wouldn't want to mentor your family, but you might, because you might kind of wring well, their neck or something. That's the reason I asked, because I'm trying to teach my mother all how to use an iPad. Yeah. And after about 10 minutes, I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> so I need some skills. Um, my, my, so suggest counseling skills <laughs> my suggestion is to actually do like the parent swap. So like swap your parents with like a best friend or a close friend and actually swap over because you won't kill them. <laughs> Only for the iPad, Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> That is, but I think that that potentially works because you don't treat you don't treat other people like you treat your family. So yeah. <laughs> you're nicer to other people. Yeah, you're nicer yeah. to other people. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to indicate. Yeah. When we talk about one eight hundred numbers being free, are they free or is it 20, like the cost of a landline call? I think on a mobile phone, it's really expensive. Well, hey, 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 yeah. we've done it. We've done it. Yeah. Tosta's done it. Yeah. So mobile and landline. Landline always was free, but. Mobiles now coming online, so we, we've already implemented that a few weeks ago, and um, the rest of the industry should do it by 1st of January. 1st of January, it's mandated, so it will be free. Yeah. Is that with government numbers as well? Yeah. If, they, if they make them 1-800. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so if they make them 1-800. So if it's a one it does not apply to 1-300. Yeah, 1-300. 1-800 on their mobile, it's free. Yeah. From 1st of January. Yeah. Unless they're with Telstra. Yeah, then they're the... Yeah. 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 I'm involved in a project where we surveyed um, about 600 uh, clients and workers across the community sector and government recently. And one of the key is about um, human services uh, delivery across the community sector and government. And one of the key uh, things that came out of that survey was, particularly from aged care clients and workers, um, that thing that you mentioned, Tegan, about people not wanting internet access. Yeah. So, the need for the project to be mindful of the fact that not everybody has internet access and that some people don't want it. So I just wondered two things. One, whether there's an onus on organisations and government to continue to, to not go totally digital, to continue to yeah. provide face-to-face -face or phone service. And secondly, how um, organisations can make sure that people don't sit through the cracks when you're rolling out training such as the GoDC program, which sounds really exciting. Yeah. But what are the mechanisms in place to make sure that that information gets out as widely as it can so people don't fall through the cracks when yeah. organisations do go digital? Sure. Um, I, I, I don't think I can really comment on the first part around go digital first. I think there should always be someone available, um, you know, where people after all. Um, in terms of falling through the cracks, I guess that's why the GoDigi program has been designed at the way that it is in that we are reaching out to organisations, not necessarily just people who are actually delivering digital literacy, but, you know, um, Places like, um, you know, uh, neighbourhood houses, I mean, they sometimes deliver digital literacy, but community health centres um, and post offices, like places where people actually do have a face-to-face -face contact and they have an established relationship with that organisation or with that location or that person. Um, and so that in, in that type of way, along with the mentor program, that we're actually reaching those people um, where they haven't been able to be reached before, because obviously a lot of programs um, are advertised online <laughs> and um, on the TV or on the radio. So 
um, by kind of having that approach where we work um, with forming partnerships with a lot of different organisations in the community and a lot of different people that um, we can address that, make sure that no one, hopefully, if, unless they want to, falls through the cracks. Yeah. So following through what you just said, does that mean that you're going to be printing brochures or, or postcards to launch go to you? Um, it's the lot. We're not having an official official launch to early oh, next year in February. Oh, so to, just to have a um, Yeah, it, I mean it'll de it'll depend on um, each different area and different community organisation and um, on how we tackle that and how if we have printed material or not or whether we provide um, digital copies for then community organisations to print off. It'll depend on the different areas. Yeah. And just with your first point, um, we've re we were hoping that was part of the. the reason we did our research was to actually show that, um, well, it has ended up showing that people do prefer seeing someone in person using a landline telephone. So we're hoping that uh, Anglican and other organisations can use that research to say <coughs> to government organisations at all levels, you still, look, there's a whole group of people that want to see someone in person or there's a whole group of people that are able to use the internet. So you can use that information to advocate for that remaining range of options of contacting. So that was, yeah, that was a real strong purpose mm -hmm. of the research. Any further questions? Yeah, well, again, sorry. <laughs> no, <it's all> right. <laughs> Mary, just in the research, was there, um, was there any questions around if they're utilising telephone service, how they want how they want that interaction to look or how they want that to be? No, it's not. <coughs> Easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ready? Yeah. <laughs> now, other questions? Well, join me with to thank you, Mary and Susan. Thank you.